we wouldn't be here today without our distinguished panelists, so um, let me introduce them to you. Um, on my immediate left is Ken Pegler, retired teacher and founding president of the Ontario Philosophy Teachers Association. Um, next to Ken is uh, Jordan H. Green, instructional designer, who has also done more than many hats in the same, and as, uh, as has, has Ken. Um, and jo Jordan is, is an alumnus um, of York University. Um, and next to Jordan is Jeunesse Hossein, barrister, solicitor, and notary public, and also first uh, number one best-selling co-author of The Unbreakable Spirit. Um, she is also an alumnus um, from York. And then next to Jeunesse is David Peck, president and founder of So Change, um, also an alumnus. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna get started with a few questions. Um, so my first question to the panelists is, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit, um, briefly tell us about your current role um, or, the, or the work that you do and the organization that you are um, with. Ken, can we start with you? Uh, hi everybody. <coughs> just to start, there are 26,500 plus teenagers taking philosophy in 452 high schools in Ontario. Uh, high school philosophy is uh, an extraordinary success story. And for those of you that are contemplating a career as a high school teacher, a philosophy high school teacher, uh, you're in on the ground floor because uh, there are practically no Ontario high school philosophy teachers with degrees in philosophy. And I was one of them. Uh, I have an MA in musicology and, and uh, cultural affairs having to do with the romantic movement in late 19th century Vienna. Uh, offhand, I'd be hard pressed to tell you about the usefulness of that, uh, other than for my own enjoyment. But uh, I taught for 33 years in Ontario high schools and I taught uh, music, I taught visual art, I taught history. But my approach to it was always to emphasize the importance of the theoretical underpinning of what I was teaching. So I guess you could say that I was teaching philosophically. And I'd been reading philosophy since I was a teenager. Well, in 1994, in the Toronto Star, there was a piece that was headlined, Holy Plato, exclamation mark, philosophy in Ontario high schools. And it was an article, quite a lengthy article, about a guy in Kingston who ran a philosophy club after school in his, in his high school. It was so successful that his principal, uh, every once in a while there is a blazingly enlightened administrator. Uh, this teacher's philosophy club was so successful that the principal let him insert it into the curriculum the following September. And the rest, as they say, is history. I had the same kind of principle, and I went to him and I said, Mike, what do you say? He said, go for it. Interestingly, the head of the history department didn't talk to me for a year after that uh, because there are certain politics involved in, in teaching senior social sciences courses that are electives. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, from 96 to 09, when I retired, uh, I taught philosophy in Ontario high schools and absolutely loved it. And so did the students. Again, 26 and a half thousand kids in 452 high schools, 50 of those high schools being francophone. So that's how I got to where I am now. And those of you that are contemplating a career as a high school <coughs> teacher, you really are in on the ground floor of quite uh, uh, a remarkable movement, a ground floor in the sense that you will be among the first philosophy high school teachers with a formal background in the subject. Thank Is that sufficient? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, Jordan. Sure. Well, hello. My name is Jordan Green, and I graduated from York, oh wow, in 96 with a philosophy degree. And while I was at York, I, I, uh, I took event. I think philosophy teaches you how to think. And I, uh, I did a lot of thinking, because I didn't know, I didn't start in philosophy, I started out, I got an acting scholarship uh, through theater arts. And I, I started in a theater arts program, and then I, 
I tried to do English and environmental studies. I stumbled, as I think many people do, into philosophy because it was something that uh, just seemed very uh, exciting and interesting. And as I stumbled into philosophy, I, uh, I stumbled into some of the other clubs and organizations. I volunteered at Excalibur, the campus paper in CHRY. And by the time I started leaving my academia career, I started freelancing for, uh, back then they had Toronto Computes and Canada Computes. Those newspapers don't exist anymore. But I also started freelancing for the Toronto Sun and the uh, Star. And I got into... Uh, uh, TV and radio. I, I worked for 680 News as a, a chase producer, and I worked for uh, for City for a while. And then when they started CP24, I was a news producer over there, and I did some on camera and and uh, videography stuff for Rogers Television back in the day. And uh, I I, uh, I slowly started to I guess. Philosophy gives you the opportunity to think about different things and try different things, and I get bored very quickly. And so I tried different careers. I, I, I left journalism, and I went into technical writing and corporate communications and marketing, and now I'm doing instructional design, which is totally unrelated in some ways to what I, I did way back when, but it's all about communications. It's all about thinking and processing knowledge and information and trying to figure out the best way to present that information to other people, to a specific audience. So that's what you do as a journalist. You're trying to figure out, you know, say the Toronto Sun is a very, say, blue-collar type paper versus the Star, which is a more a liberal newspaper. And so you're looking at different audience groups and demographics when you're writing for those papers. The same thing is when, say, I, I do a lot of consultation for the big banks. So one of my current clients is BMO or Bank of Montreal, and I do a lot of instructional design or training and development for, uh, say, the customer call center or, say, BMO's executives. Uh, and again, it's very different audiences, right? Call centers are more entry-level roles. And uh, executives, obviously, we're teaching them more about uh, presentation and messaging and how to, how to uh, stay on topic and make sure they get the, the correct uh, branding and response out when they're, they're communicating their ideas and their, th their, their, their thoughts out to the world. Uh, <coughs> so I guess, in the end, I guess I, I love what I do. And I think I, I owe a lot of it to uh, my studies at York and, if, and the, uh, the world of philosophy because it taught me to think. And I've worn many different hats, and I don't know what hats you people are wearing, but you'll probably wear many different hats too. And I'd be happy to uh, to give you tips and, and tricks and advice as you go through. Thank you, Jeanette. Sure. Jeanette. Okay, hi, I'm Jeanette Hussein. And like Jordan, I stumbled into philosophy too. I came to York to study economics. And after failing s stats, statistics twice, I said, okay, this is not for me. And uh, I, through trial and error, I wound up in philosophy with a minor in psychology. And what I loved about philosophy is that, yes, it does teach us to think. I found um, the abstract notions and concepts really twisted my brain around and got me to expand and contract when I needed to. But it is, it's all formulating these abstract theories. And that, I found, helped me a lot in my pursuit of a law degree because I had to go and write the LSAT. And uh, if many of you have uh, going down that path, philosophy does help. The, the notions of symbolic logic, um, that helps you put things in perspective and it expands and you know your mind in different ways. It's like in law we talk about uh, framing, framing of issues and the splitting of airs. And this is where your, the philosophy thinking and grappling with those concepts come into play. So I ended up actually doing my philosophy and how I ended up into law was sort of a, one of those things where you do things through adversity. One of my philosophy teachers said to me, you will never make it in law. I don't know if she's still around, though, but um, uh, when she said that, I thought, I'll show you. So anyway, I ended up uh, going, writing the LSAT and, and uh, being accepted at Osgoode Hall Law School. And uh, that, for me, was one big thing because I was a single mother at the time. So having to juggle different things, uh, some of you, you know, would understand what just being accepted at law school was a really big thing from my beginnings. And, uh, and then graduating, because in the first year, you weed it out. The tons of materials you, you get, uh, it's one of those weeding out processes and the, the employee. And that I completed the program, another success. And then moving on there to be, be 
call to the bar was great. And uh, being a mature student at the time coming in, I knew I didn't want to go into those large law firms. So I routed into working for myself um, at the get-go once I got called to the bar. And um, one thing led to another. I did uh, go to, um, I was uh, doing night court. We had night court at the time where I got my feet wet in court uh, before Justice of the Peace. So I kept that going for a while after I came out of law school. And um, eventually, wound it up full-time prosecutor for 18 years. Having come through that uh, course, I was being able to prosecute with my eyes closed. I thought, no, this is not working for me. So I branched out into uh, another line of work. I decided I wanted to learn more about spirituality. And of course, there's a link with philosophy and spirituality, too, when you, you, know, you get down to the basics. And uh, I took some courses in life coaching. I took courses in psychosomatic therapy. And I, right now, I combine all those uh, modules in my practice of law. And I find it very, very uh, uh, balancing and wholesome because people have negative notions of lawyers. And, and when people come to me and they say, you're not like other lawyers, I said, no, I am not. It's a changing world. But anyway, uh, I could go on a little bit more. I am, going, I am also teaching at uh, the Canadian Business College. Um, a few courses there I started in February. Uh, part-time so again all this changing and started with the the study of philosophy I found which was so helpful in 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 in, in my thought process and and uh, getting me to understand all these different concepts all at one and you find if any of you t will take the LSAT or heading down in that line you it's, it's going to be very beneficial anyway I look forward to uh, you know taking your questions later on Thank you, so it sounds like Janess was called to the bar only once. I'd just like to point out that I get called to the bar frequently. It uh, <laughs> <coughs> happens quite regularly. Um, I saw Moneyball on Friday night, and Brad Pitt's uh, partner, played by Jonah Hill, I believe is his name, a young comic, says, baseball thinking is medieval. They're asking all the wrong questions. And that's what philosophy taught me, and that's what uh, drew me, I think, to the discipline itself. And so uh, in 1992, I started my formal uh, training up here at York uh, in Atkinson, and it took me 10 years to finish my degree. Two courses a year, I was working professionally at the time. I'm an electrician by trade. I haven't uh, practiced the trade for uh, many years, but I still carry my union card. I am a card-carrying member of the IBEW, uh, Local 353. But I have not been on the tools, as they say, in many years. And, uh, but, but my past, uh, f philosophical past, I think, is probably grounded in a, uh, um, I hope, an understanding of the other that was, comes out of a kind of a faith-based background uh, where I was reading some, uh, basically I was reading a guy by the name of uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, who many of you have probably heard about, who was a supposed atheist who turned to Christianity later in life. And he was, uh, believe it or not, one who turned me on to Nietzsche, and I started uh, reading at about 16 um, some pretty interesting stuff that was scaring the hell out of my parents, basically. <laughs> and so it was a really interesting blend and move. I'll never forget the, the day I said to my father that I had read the Communist Ma Manifesto, and I was about 21 or ni 19 or 20 years old, and I thought my father was going to fall off the chair. And it certainly led to some pretty interesting dialogue around the pack home for the next few years, I'm sure. And so as a result of that, I spent 18 years working for the same company, uh, 10 years to get my degree here at York. Uh, it was one of the most rich and engaging times of my life. I, uh, many of the professors, I think, are still actually teaching here that I studied with. Uh, some are still my friends. And I had an incredible experience uh, up at York and am um, deeply grateful and continue to stay involved. And in fact, was here a few weeks ago on one of these panel discussions. And, and get involved when I can, can be. Real shift in my life from, a, from an ethical perspective at a time when I was, uh, finishing, I was finishing off my master's degree in philosophy at, at Guelph. I was uh, working in epistemology and the thought of Michael Polanyi and tacit knowing and felt that I was probably going to go on to do a PhD at Warwick or maybe at University of Guelph or maybe U of T. Didn't get into the program that I had hoped for. I've got a bit of a continental edge and, and uh, not very much of a, uh, a symbolic logician, but uh, that's a time for uh, another, another conversation to be sure. 
But uh, as a result of reading uh, Stephen Lewis's uh, book, Race Against Time, and, and Romeo Dallaire's book, Shake Hands with the Devil, at the time I was defending my master's thesis, I decided to uh, do some postgraduate work in international development. And as a result of that, uh, I am now the founder and director of a small company called SoChange. Uh, we come alongside companies and nonprofits and help them to ask better questions about the work that they're doing. And so they're doing good in the world that we presuppose. And we say, you're doing great work, and we're going to come alongside and help you do it in a more meaningful and substantive way. And so that means getting involved in international projects uh, from Mongolian literacy programs to child and maternal health projects in uh, Cambodia to reconciliation and justice projects in Rwanda. It's fascinating, invigorating, and in, in, infuriating work uh, on so many levels, but deeply connected to the phil philosophical uh, uh, tradition that I come out of and I guess the questions that I continue to ask. So um, look forward to uh, spending some time with you here this afternoon. Thanks for coming and for taking the time out of your days as well. And um, thanks for the invite. Thank you, David. Okay. So I think um, you, uh, all of our panelists um, sort of um, led to the, my next question is sort of um, what, what, were, what specifically was it about your background in philosophy or your um, your interest in philosophy that led that sort of um, uh, helps you um, in your career and in your work experiences. If you think back to, were there specific um, skills that you gained or um, knowledge that you um, gained as a result of your your studies and your ac your interest in philosophy that um, sort of helped you and that you apply to your um, work and uh, career experiences? Kim, would you like to start? Well, uh, we've already mentioned the importance of asking the right questions. Uh, as a kid, as a teenager, uh, the most important question that I was seeking answers for was, what do you mean by that? I'd sit in church and an authority figure would talk about what people talk about in church. And uh, I was busting a gut to ask this guy, what do you mean by that? Likewise with teachers, likewise with just about everybody who had something to say uh, with what I thought was perhaps an overweened uh, confidence, for want of a better way of putting it. And I played jazz saxophone, and because I played the way I played, uh, I got to hang out with guys that were three or four years older than me. And as a teenager, that's quite significant. And the drummer in our group was a very thoughtful guy who said, you should read this. And he kept handing me books, uh, books by Nietzsche, books by Sartre, uh, or books about them, uh, just to name two, and I started to read. And I started to realize how really powerful that question is. What do you mean by that? And I don't know where I got the guts to do it, but I started to ask people. And the answers that I got were really unsatisfactory. Uh, I guess that's about it. That's that's what was wonderful for me being a high school teacher because not just teaching music or visual art or history but uh, kind of trying to come to grips with what the issues are in any subject discipline math for instance what's a number uh, I asked a couple of math teacher colleagues of mine questions like that and they got a little bit upset uh, they really got upset with me when I had my philosophy students go and ask them those questions. Uh, and I don't mean two fingers. I mean, what is two-ness? Uh, where does that come from? Is there knowledge that, well, you know where I'm going with this. And it's true with all of the subjects in any high school curriculum. And uh, that's what was really exciting for me. Uh, First of all, as a kid, finding out the power of that question, what do you mean by that? 
and uh, and then responding to their answer by saying, well, that's not really very, satis that's not very satisfactory at all, to realizing that uh, by the time I was in my mid-30s and I was a high school teacher, uh, in spite of the fact that I was teaching uh, visual art and music, uh, I realized that there were all kinds of kids in my classes who were just like me when I was 16, 17, uh, really hungry for, uh, for answers to things. Is there a supreme being? Uh, you know where I'm going with this, I'm sure. And uh, that's what was really wonderful for me uh, with the gift of this older teenager who started to hand me books that no one had handed to me before. And yeah, the conversations around the dinner table were pretty interesting too. Uh, so that's where it came from for me. I think uh, that's a sweet story. I think um, for me, it, it all comes down to questioning as well, but in a, a different line, because I come from a journalism background and from a, a constantly taking different types of information and processing that information. So I'm always questioning the content providers. Um, when I was a journalist, you know, I, I talked to politicians and uh, they'd spin something one way and you know it wasn't exactly totally true. And so you're trying to find out the truth. And to get to that truth, you have to constantly question their values and their morals to get them to, to, to stand by them, to get them to answer for what they are doing in, as a greater whole. And I think philosophy has taught me to uh, never just accept uh, something as at face value, to question it, to continually ask questions, to continually chase until you find whatever it is that is true or that is uh, as close to the truth as you can get. Um, you know, when I was a reporter, a very old reporter many eons ago, uh, who has passed through every newsroom, has uh, been known to say, follow the money. And they say that because money is, is you know, whoever spends money on whatever it is, be it a, a park or uh, a new traffic light or uh, a new government policy, uh, wherever the money is coming from, that's how you can find, trace it back to the source, to the truth. But it, it doesn't always work. Uh, I think because the decision to spend that money, to build that park or to put that traffic light somewhere, came from someone, someone's mind, someone's thought process, some, some ideology, some values, some, some needs. And you have to question those needs and values. And I think philosophy taught me to uh, always push and always to ask and never to be afraid to ask questions. I think uh, one of the sad things about our information overloaded society is we, we see things on Twitter or Facebook and we accept them for the truth. We don't really th take the time to actually think and to question that. I think we should. I think as philosophy majors and philosophy graduates, hopefully, we do take the time to think and to sort things out for ourselves to, s to find what is true. Sure. Um, as a lawyer, one of the main things we do ask questions. We ask questions and ask questions. So you could see that being my philosophy background, being the underpinning for these asking of the questions. And uh, um, what uh, really turned me on was, uh, as a philosophy student, is the question of why do I exist? What is the purpose of my existence? Who am I? Why am I here? And uh, those questions led to more questions. And then I, just, I, I came to the conclusion that um, the answers are not so important in philosophy. It's the questions. Um, it's asking the questions. And, and, and from then to now, you will know if you ask a question, it hooks the mind right away. You don't offer explanations, you ask questions. And uh, that led me down the road to actually, how many of you uh, know of the philosopher Rene Descartes? Yeah? Okay. You, then you would know Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. And where I stand right now, I don't believe that any longer. My, uh, I'm going on to go out on a limb here and say this, that I, my position is that I am, therefore I think. And uh, that says a lot. And that's coming from a, a, a 
totally spiritual background uh, foundation where the thinking is part of the ego. But I don't want to go too far on that uh, because right now we are focusing with the changes that's going on cosmically, focusing on the heart realm and thinking with the heart is, is where the focus is. And uh, so I'm coming from that place of I am, therefore I think. David. So it may just be because because I'm tired, Sandra, but I've actually forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't thinking about it. I'm panel number, <laughs> I'm number four. You know. We'll go with you next. Uh, for the no you, you can go first for the next question. Okay. Um, so the question is basically, um, what what specifically um, have you gained from your background in philosophy that has informed you your work, um, informed your career? Right. Benefited your career? So it would be belaboring the point to say it's taught me how to ask good questions. <laughs> but uh, philosophy truly has done that. Um, but I think it's uh, about how to think, I think, really is what it comes down to, and also how to read. And uh, I remember reading Mortimer Adler's book, all 400 pages of it, How to Read a Book, which just cracks me up that uh, anyone would write that book in the first place. But uh, what really stood out to me was it, it taught me how to read a book. It taught me to pick it up and to look at the bibliography first and to look at footnotes and to look at the titles of the chapters and then to go back and if I had the time in the bookstore at the shelf to spend five or ten minutes reading paragraphs throughout and this is what I've gone forward with using this as a tool for what books to A, read, what is now on my ten foot bookshelf because I used to have a five foot bookshelf, it's now ten feet by the way, and that just continues to grow. Those are the books that I need to read. I calculated at some point in my life I could read 2,500 books uh, approximately based on what I was doing at the time and that's not a lot when you consider what's being published on a daily basis and just within the discipline and so on and I'm, I'm a person who is um, the only thing I'm interested in is everything. And that's <laughs> deeply problematic, right? It's not just attention deficit disorder. It's, I mean, G.K. Chesterton said the only thing, uh, there's no such thing as an uninteresting subject, only disinterested people, right? Love that quote. It's true. And so I fall into that category. So for me, philosophy has taught me um, uh, how to think, how and what to read, the art of conversation, the ability to ask a, a well-defined, hopefully well-thought-out question. You can tell a lot about the nature of a, a person by, by the kinds of questions they ask. I think that there is a, a fundamental truth there about who we are and uh, the way we go forward to, towards you know, building better relationships and so on. And that, this can be you know, at home, it can be at work, it can be uh, um, you know, where we play as well. And I think for me now today, as a development worker working uh, in, in the field, and, teach, and I also teach uh, uh, issues in international development at Humber College in their business school, I do that once a year, and I'm currently teaching it right now to postgraduate students. And what's really interesting to me is in order to be a good development worker, in order to do a proper needs assessment, in order to write a log frame matrix, which you logicians would love, is because of the causological uh, stuff that goes into them. It's all about getting to a better place, uh, to, a, to a more refined question. And it requires a willingness to do that and a security in one's position to say, I, I can stand here and ask this question knowing what I know and still feel good about not only myself, but my belief systems and my structure and so on. And it's so fundamentally important and I think, I think philosophy allowed me to do that. And, and it also allowed me to really build some strong relationships that, like I said earlier, I still have today. And I was fortunate enough to work with professors, and I hope you all do too, that are into a dialogical approach, that are into a working, I don't like the way this panel's set up, by the way. I've read a lot of Foucault. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you have too. I think there's some serious disconnects in our whole pedagogical system. Oh, it's anti-relational. Right. I'd rather be sat Foucault. in a circle today, probably. That would be more meaningful to me in some respects. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's something deeply problematic about the way we set ourselves up to build, or frankly, to deconstruct relationships uh, going into the future. And this applies to business and, and, all, and all that. Uh, and all that stuff. Uh, how's that for being philosophical? So, <laughs> so yeah, so those are um, a few of the things that philosophy did for me that, uh, I mean, I would be uh, a completely different person without my experience here at York, and I'm not just selling to school, but uh, I was truly blessed uh, to have the experience that I had. So it's, it's about 
how and what to read, how and what to think, how and what to speak. And uh, I think, yeah, the nature of asking a good question. What did, uh, uh, come on, we all love the quote from uh, The Matrix, don't we? It's the question <laughs> that drives us, Neil. Uh, there are no spoons. That's, there is no spoon, <laughs> yeah. Blue pill or red pill. The question that drives us, yeah. That's right, yes. <laughs> Most of the time, actually. <laughs> It's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was as I was standing here and listening to our panelists thinking this is setup is kind of not the right setup for this panel but it is what it is so we'll continue carry well, on. Well I'm an expert yeah. after all don't you know? You're from a circle. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all the answers. I'm speaking into the microphone. So David we'll, we'll start with you for the next question. Um, if when what specific advice would you give um, to students and new grads who are asking the question, what can I do with a degree in philosophy, or what can I do with a liberal arts degree, or what can, what can I do with, uh, once I graduate from York? Um, and, and they're sort of in that process of exploring their career options and their career interests and so forth. What specific advice would you um, give to them about what they could be doing now to um, explore those options and make some informed, ask good questions, and make some informed decisions for mm -hmm. themselves? Well, believe it or not, and this was not just a rhetorical technique, but I would probably throw, ask another question back to you and say, you know, where do you want to be? What are you, what, you know, you've got to start beginning to manage your own expectations. And where do you want to be? Is it graduate school that you're heading to next? Is it a job that you want to do? Do you want some volunteer experience? Would you like to do some international development? Uh, do you want to get involved locally? Do you want to get into the business world? Are you hoping to get into the academic world? I mean, there's a whole series of questions that I would fire back at you over, I would hope, a period of time as we tried to unpack that together. So, I mean, it's a, a, you, you, you do have to continue to, uh, and this, of course, I have no idea where you all are. Some of you are first year, maybe. Some of you are uh, about to graduate. I don't really know. Um, and so the questions would be different, I think. And so you need to be looking at things that are going to help prepare you for what next steps you are hoping to take. And so uh, I live in a hope-so world. I'm a hopeful cynic. Uh, I mean, some people would just call that realism, I suppose, but, but I'm truly idealistic to the platonic core, and yet I work in development where I see uh, aid money wasted uh, like you wouldn't believe on a regular basis. And so I try to maintain that sense of uh, um, uh, optimism while also this, you know, harsh sense of realism working in, in these kinds of communities and realizing that still uh, good is occurring. So I think you need to start uh, continuing to refine your own uh, questions about where you want to be. Maybe make up a, a, a pro and con list. Um, is it graduate school? Uh, is it a trade? Uh, is it, um, uh, is, it the, is it the corporate world? So I think I think that would probably be uh, um, based on what little I know of my audience. Okay. I, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Jeanette. Okay. Um, I have a problem with uh, people saying you have to ask a good question or the right question. Um, especially at the university level or training, learning level. To me, you, you have to start just asking questions, getting your voice heard, getting that voice, being in touch with that voice. So many people, you hear that and then you, you be, go back inside because you think, I don't know what to say, or I don't know if this, this question is gonna make me feel stupid. In my training as, uh, as, as a philosophy student, I was asking questions. It, you just have to get into that mode of asking a question. And, and the people who want to criticize you, just put on the blinders and ask the questions. Because this is how you get into yourself and you get to learn more about who you are. Um, and uh, so the, the, the questions itself in terms of uh, what to ask yourself as to where you're going, I would say um, I'm going to touch back on what I said earlier about thinking with your heart. Um, because we, we get into monkey chatter with our brains, and I'm sure you're aware of this. You sit and you just think, 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 think. It, it, in this day and age, um, the focus is in getting silent. Ask the question and go silent. The answer will come up. It's good to make your list 
of what it is you want to do, but sometimes you, you're unsure. That's the, if you're a first year student, you don't know what you want to do because I didn't know what it is I want to do. I just thought I'm here, I'm going to learn something. I have ideas of what I want to do and, and, and I, when, what I went in to, when I came into, law, into university, that's not what, how I came out. Completely different uh, line, uh, line of work. So the focus, I think, is really going within as opposed to doing too many um, right, uh, left brain thinking and just bringing the balance within yourself and asking and, and, and just be quiet and let the, the answer come up. Because it, it is challenging it's for all of us to figure out what it is we want to do. But the, the good side to this is that you may start with one thing. Like many of us, we started with one thing and we went on to different things. No, no longer do we have to stay in one career. We can have three, four, five. I just became an author. So, you know, I don't know where that's going to take me. I want to be a transformational speaker. My co-author is a, a, a breakthrough specialist, Lisa Nichols. I, I aspire to be like her, to be able to help people uh, transition out of their mental blocks, out, out of the veils that they go around in, coming out of the square thinking mentality and open up their minds. You know, so uh, I, I still see myself growing and being a, a, being a student for life. So um, just, just uh, try that and see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. I think I like that student of life. I think that's what a, a lot of philosophy uh, grads and students are, is because we're always asking questions, we're always thinking, and uh, I think that's kind of what took me from uh, being a, a student reporter to being an instructional designer these days. And I think my best advice to give to uh, you know first year students is the same to give to uh, graduating students is just to try everything, figure out what your strengths are. And if you're really good at something, if you're good at, say, logic, or if you're good at math, that kind of side, if you're good at the creative, the writing, the uh, essays, the, um, you say, graphics or design or that kind of stuff, focus on your strengths. Because if you're good at it, you probably enjoy it. And if you're enjoying something, uh, then you'll probably make a very good career out of it. Uh, I know uh, we've all heard the stories of people who sit at their jobs for 25 years, maybe longer, and they can't stand their jobs because they aren't doing what they love. Well, it's because they haven't really taken the time to think about who they are and try and figure out where they want to go in life. They haven't thought about their strengths, their weaknesses, and they haven't really followed their hearts. And I, I find people who are really good at what they do, uh, it's not just that they're good at what they do, they love what they do. They have a passion for it. And they have that passion because they took the time through self-discovery to figure out what it is that they want to do. And you know, you may sit here, you know, nowadays in your university lives, thinking I'm going to be this, and you may end up being that. But ten years from now, it may be something else. I've gone through several different careers. I think uh, that's just life. I think that's part of being uh, a philosophy graduate, maybe a philosopher, is to always be trying different things, always experimenting, always trying to figure out who you are and your role in society, and figure out what you're good at, and chasing your heart, and finding out what it is you really want to do in your life. And what you want to do now, in your you know teens and 20s, is probably different than when you're in your 30s and 40s and 50s and so on, because life is a constant tug and pull of all the different interests that you could possibly ever have. and. Uh, so I think my best advice is just try different things. Don't be afraid to try things. You know, uh, York is a commuter school. I know a lot of people, they come to class, and then they probably go home. Get involved in extracurricular clubs. Uh, I started out in, in student newspapers and a campus radio station. And that led to a career as a freelance journalist and a, a TV producer. Um, you can try different things. You know, get involved in the linguistics club, the chess club, anything. Whatever your passion is, just try it. And I, I think uh, you'll have a good result that way. How many of you have a pretty good idea of what it is that you want to do as a career? So most of you then don't have a clue. Is that correct? Uh, I really don't envy you because you've got to reconcile your idealism with practicality. And uh, as, far as, as far as questions to ask, uh, well, a little bit of a sidebar. Uh, my father always told me that I was a late bloomer. And uh, 
it was certainly true. I didn't have a clue about what, I, what really made me happy until I was 33, and it was teaching. I was a musician for most of the time between graduate school and that. And there was a certain romance uh, in the instability of it all and the, the, now that I look back, not terribly, not a lot of coolness about it either. But um, 33, and I suspect that most of you are much younger than that. Uh, I was lucky, and I sincerely hope you are too, uh, in finding what it is that uh, really makes you happy and earns you a really good living. Uh, high school teaching was it for me. Uh, so it comes down to balancing or reconciling your realism with practicality. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the utilitarian calculus, uh, the pro con list that I, I think uh, was mentioned here. Uh, that's a good way to go. And I guess the big question is, how in debt are you and how much more in debt are you willing to suffer for want of a better way of putting it uh, i don't have anything pithy to say about it other than that thank you all right i think at this point we can take some questions from the floor if anybody has a, any a question um you can i'd ask you to stand up and then um, um yes and i'll repeat the question um, well, I guess I'd start by saying that, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that uh, most of us are graduating into a world that's economically and politically a lot really, really harsh. Um, and I don't know if that's just naivete speaking, but um, that seems to be the way it is. And a lot of us who have uh, insurmountable debts um, or otherwise just really want to get working so that this, uh, the last <coughs> four or more years will not have been for not. Um, we want to be a little more curious about, or at least I'm really curious to how I turn my humanities or my liberal arts or so on background into a marketable commodity um, in terms of a job interview or in terms of even getting my foot in the door for an interview. Um, so I guess I'm curious as to if you have any anecdotes maybe where you had a job interview or you met somebody and where it was specifically a uh, philosophy that really wowed an employer or got you that. So I'll just re repeat the question for the camera. Um, so the question is about what, uh, so how, um, asking the panelists if they've got any specific examples or anecdotes, anecdotes that they can share related to how they took their liberal arts background, academic background, and, and a actually managed to translate that into a job interview or a job yeah. or something that led to a job. Okay. So I think, I think you have to get creative. I think it's a great question. I think it's an important one. Uh, Oh, yeah. No, I, I actually rather you say <laughs> <laughs> it will affect the quality of my answer. <laughs> kidding, by the way. Um, by the way, four years is just because you get a job doesn't mean it's going to make it meaningful. Uh, it's, it already has been, I think, and I hope that you'll look back and you'll get a sense for that. I mean, it's meaningful either way, right? It's not kind of an either or distinction, it seems to me. Just because you get a job doesn't make the last four years uh, worthwhile. Um, so a friend of mine who's a comic who ended up working at Yuck Yucks for about five or six years tried to get on the CBC television show that they had called Comics ten years ago, maybe? And it was a series that ran, and most of them were horrible, if you've seen them. You could probably find them online, and some of these comics went on to do some really interesting things, and some uh, not so much. So this friend of mine uh, w couldn't get an interview, couldn't get a call back from the producers of the TV show. Very difficult to get through those layers of administration at a school like York or at an organization like the CBC. So he took a briefcase, filled it with Smarties, um, took a hand uh, and put his business card in a plastic hand and put it in the middle of the briefcase and somehow oh. secured it there, filled it with Smarties, <laughs> wrapped it up in brown paper, uh, paper, craft paper, and shipped it to the producer. It probably <laughs> wouldn't fly today. It would you know, probably get scanned at the door, would be my guess, right? It would be x-rayed. As a result of that, not only did that creative approach get him the interview, he actually ended up filming a comic special as well, made the money, and went on to have a de decent career as a comic for about five or six years. So 
uh, anecdote, uh, but the simple answer is you're going to have to be really creative. The reality is it is a harsh climate, but if you're creative and willing to approach it from a fresh and relational perspective, you will get in the door. You will get in the door because that's going to set you aside from the other 722 resumes that are coming through this particular door that you want to get through, depending, of course, on the job that you're applying for. Some may be way more specific than that. And you've got to start, you know, to, to, to get so cliche, thinking outside the box is an understatement. You've got to take it so beyond that to say, how can I stand out? And it's not colored paper on your resume, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's actually in my world, that probably would get you in the trash can. Uh -huh. Give, give me something a little more rich, interesting, and personal that says something about who you are and the type of, you know, you use the phrase, I'm not, commodity that you're going to be. Okay? That's, I think I it's how you, I think being creative is part of it, but I think it's also how you spin it. And I think you, you have remarkable skills and talents as philosophy students and philosophy grads. You're very logical. You're very process driven. You're very analytical. These are all highly, highly valuable traits in, in a, a corporate world because all corporations, what are they looking for? They're very logical. They're too process driven, right? In order to, you know, I, I, one of my clients is BMO, or actually Amex and all the other financial services companies. If I have a, a suggestion for how to do something better, it goes up the chain to the president, goes through all the VP, goes through several directors, they all make their comments and feedback, and then they send it back to me, then I have to send it all the way back up the chain, very process driven. So as philosophy students and grads, you're going to have this analytical, logical, uh, deeply analytical and deeply logical mind in terms of driving processes. And I think if you spin it on your resumes that you, you are very good with logic, very good with processes, you're very adaptable to uh, figuring out and analyzing and, and diving in and getting into these processes that businesses have. You're, you're very good at, at just following processes. You'll, you'll be a, a, a shoe in for many uh, corporate gigs. Um, I don't know about Smarties in a, a bag. Um, it's kind of cool. It's a cool concept that's creative. I think if you get into like an advertising or marketing or creative type uh, business, uh, then you'd probably want to go into that kind of, you know, uh, ploy to be creative, but if you're looking at like a corporate gig at IBM, you know, it used to be known as the blue suit world because that's all everyone ever wore, um, then you're looking at just business processes, just thinking, just being able to um, take an idea and run with it, uh, being adaptable and creative in, in that kind of context. I'd like to put another spin on that. Um, who, was, who knows the actor Jim Carrey? Jim Carrey, okay, Jim Carrey got where he is because he sat on a hill day after day for a solid week and envisioned he wanted to have, in, in 1995, I believe it was, he wanted to have $5 million. He saw the $5 million check in his hand. He envisioned it. He said he would not, he, repu he, he talked the story. I don't have a television, by the way, but I, I've, I am aware of the story. Um, so he, he was giving a speech and he, he said it. He, he would not leave the hill until he saw the check. Now this is the uh, stuff, uh, it's called the law of attraction. It's also called we are all energy beings and we start with energy. Money is energy. You have your passion, what is passion? If you really live your passion and you're passionate about something, the money will follow. Um, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is money, um, energy grows where energy goes. So the more you say to yourself, it's harsh, it's harsh, it's har harsh, you're going to manifest more of that. You know, you have to kind of get away from the, the negative thinking and know that you are going to accomplish or you're going to get what it is you want. Now, you have to understand that uh, the brain is one side of you and then there's, there's your con subconscious side which rules you. So uh, it doesn't know fact or fiction. So you tell yourself, uh, like Jim Carrey, he's an, a perfect example, one of the perfect examples out there. And then there is uh, uh, Lisa Nichols. She started off with a, a, a single mother, didn't have uh, diapers for her baby. And she worked on herself. She, whatever is inside is reflected outside. So 
my spin on this is that it's it's you you encompass all these ideas. It's not only the going after um, a certain thing, but you have to give all that energy, a positive energy. Think positively about what it is you want. Envision it, feel it, taste it, and and that's what I have done. I've noticed, and I get what I want when I go go through that that mindset. Uh, for example, in nineteen. Um, it was in 1980, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I worked in the office of the premier and I saw all these men, or all these politicians, actually I felt I was going to be a politician. And all these men uh, who had these big titles, they were all lawyers. So I said, oh, that's what I'm going to do. So by 1989, I was in law school. This is 1980 when I was working in the office of the premier as a clerk. So, you know, I said this is what I wanted. I wrote it down. So all these little steps you have to do as well as the other steps the other panel members are speaking about. So it's not just one thing. You have to incorporate a lot of things. The creativity is great. Like, for instance, if someone, um, I was in hiring and someone sent me colored paper or neon green paper, I will accept it. <laughs> I said, wow, this person is creative. Send your resume I to her. I like that. <laughs> you see? So because there are so many different uh, em employers out there. It's just not corporate. And, and look at how many entrepreneurs have sprung up over the last few years. You know, it's, it's phenomenal how many millionaires we have right here in Toronto. So it's, don't focus, don't, don't get narrow, narrow on one particular thing. Open your mind up a little to be, to explore your creativity and, and know who your market is and know who you're going to, um, you know, know more about the, the, the environmental culture in which you're going into. Like if you're being approaching so change, no, no orange paper, no, no neon paper. If you're approaching uh, jeunesse, uh, Oh, yeah, I, I, you know, orange paper, yellow paper, that's me. I will hire people who give me this. You know, I love color. Uh, maybe it's because I'm colored, I don't know. But anyway, I just want you to uh, be aware, you know, just expand that mind a little bit because that's what philosophy does for you too. Thank you. Do you have any interest in being a high school teacher? Me? Yeah. Um, not high school. I was thinking of selling my soul back. Okay. So that was a joke that did not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, la I laughed inside. Yes, yeah. <laughs> me too. Uh, a, a good oh, friend Steve. of mine, I'm a like good friend of mine, is in fact a contract professor, and uh, uh, pick anything but that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, wow. the way university, the way university administration is is treating mm. their academic staff is appalling. But that is for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that could be our next panel, couldn't it? <laughs> um, as for high school, I never really thought too deeply about it. Either did I. Okay. The reason I'm asking, uh, really quick anecdote. Um, I was doing a PhD in the early 70s and was faced with considerable long-term debt and the possibility of never being hired in Canada, Ontario particularly. In the early 70s, uh, there seemed to be some cachet about uh, being an American academic working in Canada. In any event, uh, a friend of mine who I'd uh, done a lot of gigs with was invited to the brand new jazz studies program at Humber. And he said, I need a history teacher for a year. So I went and I taught history of uh, concert and jazz music to the young jazzers at Humber. And uh, at the end of my contract, uh, that was the end of it. And I went back to being a freelance musician and a couple of other things. To my great amazement, uh, I realized how much I missed teaching. Mm -hmm. And some friends of mine said, well, why don't you bite the bill bullet and get a B-Ed? So that's my suggestion to you. Bite the bullet, get a B-Ed, as a fallback position. Now, if you really like high school teaching, which I did, uh, your student debts get uh, amazingly quickly, and you are embarked on a wonderful career. That's really, uh, in defense of being narrow, that's my uh, suggestion. If teaching's not for you, then ignore the above. Actually, I do have an anecdote about a teaching <laughs> situation. My girlfriend's daughter um, got her B, her B.Ed. 
and she volunteered, and I don't know if this will work for those of you who want to do it, but you, have, you try these things. She, she volunteered at a nearby school, no pay, and she worked there for a year, and as soon as a position became available, guess who they hired? So that's another little strategy. Before I take the next question, I just wanted to sort of summarize um, our panelists' comments. But I think um, in answer to your question, um, I think what the panelists were saying is, first of all, um, be open to a variety of opportunities, even those that you uh, um, may not have considered. Um, you may surprise yourself, um, and you may be pleasantly surprised by what you discover um, as you're exploring uh, those other opportunities. Um, positive thinking helps. Um, so. And um, not only positive thinking, but creative and creative and out of the box thinking. Um, so all those skills that you gain from your philosophy degree, apply those um, to your job search, to your career development. Um, and think strategically. Think also about okay, so what is it about me? What makes me unique? What are some of the key skills, assets, um, strengths that I have to offer? And why would somebody be interested in someone like me? Um, and then um, engage people in conversations. Develop. Um, and build meaningful relationships, and that's how you will um, find out about opportunities and be and, and be considered for opportunities. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Relationships. Thank you. Um, you had a question. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you do when um, life hits you? you? You know, you talk about how you have to be positive. You have to go and find your interests. And, you know, be passionate about whatever. You like you're passionate about a whole bunch of things. But what happens when you dedicate your time to a certain aspect and um, you don't quite get there yet and then you just kind of, like it feels like it's a stat stat kind of thing. So what do you, like how do you, pass, like how do you go about, like as a lot, like I don't know if I'm getting kind of clear, how do you go, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with setbacks you mean? I'd say don't give up. Just keep trying, keep plugging along. Um, we all fail. We all often take many steps back. Anytime, uh, like I, I, I'm a consultant, I run my own business, and I've started other businesses in the past, and uh, they haven't all succeeded. I think um, you learn from your mistakes just as well as you learn from your, 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 your successes, and I think a setback is just a learning stone. Uh, it, it's just a, 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 a way to think about how to go about uh, avoiding that mistake in your, your future. And I, I think it's something that you shouldn't use as a, a negative, try and make it positive. And I know that's hard uh, because, you know, sometimes things can seem very tragic and, and, and all-encompassing. It's like life is over, but it's not. Uh, the, the sun will come up tomorrow, and I think uh, as long as you, you always learn from your mistakes and try and move forward, uh, that's how you can overcome things. Uh, unlike Jordan, I'm not convinced the sun is coming up tomorrow, but that's a whole <laughs> other story. Um, I think that set set setbacks today, uh, you will see, I hope, I trust, as stepping stones in the future. So uh, I don't know if any of you are reading uh, Kierkegaard at all, but, uh, you know, Pascal said it as well, right? You, you, freedom, choice, and responsibility. So you step forward, you don't understand why, you have no idea what's going on. And five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're gonna look back and you're gonna see what hopefully turns out to be a, on the surface, discontinuous thread. But once you start to actually peel back some of those layers, you'll make sense out of it in a way that you can't see today. So I think the idea of being positive is huge and just stepping forward and, and, and realizing that there's, you know, there's some risks involved and, and uh, you're, you're uh, you know, you might get stung a little bit along the way, but you, you've got to continue to, to, to step forward. So, I mean, there's, there's lots to be said about that, I think, but I mean, it would depend on the nature of the setback too, right? Is it a rejected resume or is it a death in the family? I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I think uh, panel advice at that point might break down. Have you heard of uh, Charles Waddle, I think his name is? His book is entitled, I, I think he's a philosopher, a motivational speaker too, it, he, it says, a setback is a setup for a comeback. Hmm. How perfect is that? You do learn from each and every experience that uh, you encounter, and it makes you 
stronger in many ways and, and um, you just keep going and building a, a, a good tool is having a good um, support system with relationships. This is where relationships are key, having a great support system. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of that. Yes. I think one of the key things uh, that we're here for is information and there was a statistic mentioned by, by Ken, uh, Mr. Pegler. I wanted to ask, is there uh, information that you guys could guide us to in terms of statistics for philosophy? I have other reasoning uh, asking this as well, but I don't want to get into a drawn out explanation, but just statistics and philosophy, in my experience, are very, very difficult to get. A uh, statistic like the one you mentioned about 26 and a half thousand students in 452 schools, that's great. If I could ask where the source of that is and if there's more information on statistics for students, uh, graduates of philosophy, where they end up, what can be done with it, but statistics specifically. E EPA, doesn't So just to EPA. clarify, what, no, what types of statistics are you looking for? Are you, are you talking about, um, you know, the rate I of employment? As, or? as broadly as philosophy in as an industry, as broadly as that, and as specific as how many students uh, go to a university, what are the percentage, so 1% of direct students are philosophy students, how many of them graduate, how many of them get employed, how soon, and all these sort of important statistics that I think for philosophy majors or minors uh, would be very relevant, or even graduates. I graduated six years ago from here, but still very pertinent to me for another reason. The statistics, and it's 26,521. Okay. Uh, we got those from uh, there's a statistics part department in the Ministry of Education. And I don't know exactly what it's called because one of the OPTA, uh, one of my colleagues uh, got this. And as far as the Ministry of Education, the high school division is concerned, uh, the most recent stats are June of 09. Now because there's a ministry for universities, for post-secondary, I'd suggest that you see if they have a similar stats department there. Now, as far as York is concerned, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, incidentally, uh, one of your distinguished teachers here, David Jopling, is a founding, uh, is one of the founders of OPTA. Wonderful guy. Uh, a couple of years ago, in the not very distant past, he had a brochure advertising the philosophy department here. And just the kinds of stats that I think might interest you were on it. Uh, one had to do with um, uh, philosophy undergraduates apparently ace LSATs uh, more than any other uh, subject discipline. Is that the kind of thing you're after? That would help. Uh, there's whole, a, there's David, an article kicking around David has, that David yeah? showed me. Yeah, well, David ago, has a yeah. sheet of yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. And it's it's very it's very re revealing, and uh, we used a little bit of it to uh, to promote some of our activities. So, talk to David Joplin. Okay, thank you. Can that help? Does that answer your question? Uh, well, yes, it brings you to a source. I'll email uh, okay. David Joplin. Um, thank you. Just uh, two other resources. So you you talked about the Ministry of Education um, on their website. Um, um, you might want to search key performance indicators, and if, so if you're looking for something related to employment, um, and you know graduates from this major or, or this particular faculty or, or program, and the rates of employment and that kind of information, then you might find that under key performance indicators. Um, also at York, there's an, the Office of Institutional Research um, may have some of those statistics that you're looking for as well. Okay. Office of Institutional Research. Yes. I don't have any stats, but I have an interesting antidote. Um, whenever I, I, I go and I uh, peruse new clients or and I'm, I'm meeting with executives and they find out I've taken philosophy, uh, they, they always joke about how, how uh, I must have been very good at school or, or, or how tough it was when they took philosophy in school. So I think that kind of says something about the program that you're in. It's a very, uh, it's a very challenging program academically and it's thought it's very well respected out in, in the corporate world uh, mm -hmm. as, as producing a lot of really good deep thinkers. It's actually related to I'm coming up with a business plan in order to recruit to a government organization to give a grant, but you have to do industry research. 
It's amazing the statistics you can get on any industries these days, but philosophy, there's nothing. I've gone to ministries, internet research, everything I can't find. It's also probably because philosophies are very small, or it was when I was a, a student here at York, it was a very small uh, faculty. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was president of the, the Philosophy Students Association way back when, and we had you know, our typical monthly or weekly meetings, and on average, five people would show up. You know, and you know, this is a campus with what, 60,000 people on it? Uh, five people? Um, so it, it's a fairly small uh, faculty, and I, I'd imagine it's pretty small in terms of faculties across other universities too, but then again, that's also, it kind of puts you in the elite too, right? This is my uh, comment or my questions about job career, especially in Canada, especially at university. It's like a, the distribution of cookbook among hungry people. Because society, for example, in society, some people cannot, you know, after that, you, you tell them, okay, you can apply like that and apply like that. But they don't have any food. The same with university. Just I give an example of York University. I'm like a TA, right? Like a PhD student. I work for a professor just with a master. When I want to apply, they don't answer at all, right? Because the system is not democracy. I don't know why they, they want to choose this one, why they want to choose, right? It's not at all. And after that, they expected me to tell I'm the best, and other people, they are not good. So it ethically doesn't make sense for me, because it's just my idea, right? So, but you, you talk about a lot about, for example, position or job. But I think in this society, we have external problem with some people, some group, especially to become professor at the university. Because really like mafia system, nobody knows why they select. I have never <laughs> heard why this thing, just it's like free market, like I go and buy milk, now I can go buy a degree. You know, ethically is almost zero. You know, so I don't know, I applied many, many, several times, even more, like a volunteer. I had the judge, I said, okay, I teach, no money. But even for this, they don't ask me. So it's just you want to be volunteer to take up garbage from the, the street, that is So why do, you, do you have a question for our panelists? Yes, why, why is this, is this type of situation? What's, what's really, you think it's useful, your speech like that, to find a job in this kind of situation? That's the question. Well, just to keep in mind, uh, our panelists aren't speaking from the academic, aren't, they're not representative of academia. So you, I, I believe. So anyway, he's talking about like university, right? Like about high school, I uh, like about environment, academic environment. So my question is exactly about academic environment, nothing less, nothing more. So what specifically is your question? Yes, it's a question you speak about that, why I can find a job. Hmm. Exactly, at York University, when they, uh, they accept with a master, and they do not accept because it's the highly qualification and so And it's a job in academia that specifically yes, exactly. that you're yeah. interested in. I, I don't know if our panelists have a comment for that, but um, um, we you can might be able to follow it. up and 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 the people that are doing the hiring uh, ask them, you know, if they've seen your your resume, if you've had any interviews, and try and follow up and find out um, what it is that they look for specifically and make sure that your uh, resume and that if you get an interview that you're answering whatever it is that they're looking for specifically in those th those documents and that speaking point. To me, I don't know not to describe and change your thing about 20 times my CV. What can tell you my CV? Just two pages, my personality. Yeah. Just I can cheat and not everything. It's not my personality. No, but if, if, you follow, if you follow up and try and talk to the, the, the movers and shakers, the people who are doing the hiring, find out exactly what they're looking for. I don't ask for that, honestly, that's a long time, but always they say, okay, take, the, for example, appointment, but yeah. Dean is not the person who can speak. You know, it's bureaucracy, everybody knows this system. Maybe if you just, I don't know how you've approached them, but if you, um, if you approach them it, with uh, the idea of just like an information interview, you're just talking to them to find out what it is that they look for because you're interested in getting a job in that field, then maybe they'll, they'll, they'll answer your questions, right? If you say, I want a job and you know, I, I want you know, to, 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 to be here now, they might get a little uh, pushed up against a wall. But if you're, you're saying, I just need information, what do you guys look for when you hire someone? Uh, they, they, they might, you know, if someone came to me and said, well, I look for when I hire someone, I wouldn't be offended. I just, you know, give them 
uh, the, the answer, right? So. Can you just step in? Is that geothermal still in field crudability coordinator? And it also do chemistry for it's not just a crudability for PhD and MA. I would suggest two things. First of all, the University of Paris has done several articles specifically on the case of philosophy students in academia within the last two years. Worth taking a look at those, they have stats, they also have a lot of survey material in there. Hmm. Second of all, talk to Kristen Andrews in your department. She's one of the two profs that run the professional development series for PhDs and MA students in philosophy. She probably knows more about this than anyone in the department, and she's been working with PhDs precisely on this issue for several years now. I think the reality is, too, that this is not just something that is happening in the academic world. I mean, what are the factors that get you a job? I mean, who really knows? And I think that, uh, you know, the phrase that has become so popular, trite and cliche in the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's all about relationships. Well, what does that exactly mean? Uh, but I do think what it means is that there's a relational component to getting work today that wasn't there maybe 20 or 30 years ago. So to assume that you're going to get a job based on a piece of paper I think is a problem. It's You've got to go deeper than that. And what does that mean? I don't know. But there's a variety of different factors that are going to come into play. So in the academic world, it's going to mean different things than it might mean in the banking world. But this is what I meant. Uh, you know, are you going to send Smarties to uh, the president of the Royal Bank of Canada? Probably not. I but agree with try Excuse me. Sorry, David. You're, you're going to try to be creative and, and somehow to connect relationally. Uh, I, all I was going to say was that I agree with you. The uh, uh, hiring, uh, don't look for transparency in spite of what all of those idealistic, what I, those idealistic binders that, that companies and universities put out. Um, uh, networking is huge. It really is who you know. And the more attractive the position that's being offered, uh, the higher the chance that it's already been taken and that the job has been posted because uh, of a regulation that requires that. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm speaking because of uh, uh, circumstances that a good friend of mine is in right now over exactly what we were talking about and your quip about contract prof. I just want to say, yeah, your question sent me back, um, back into the 80s. My, all my profess, uh, philosophy professors were in the same position as you. And now I, I'm thinking, God, I'm so glad I didn't. I was going to go MA and PhD in philosophy, but I got sidetracked into law, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. They, it seems to be the, the pool of philosophy professors are this small. So openings are going to be this small. So you're competing with all these different uh, philosophy students. Uh, so just uh, be, as the, the panels are saying, creative. I think to maybe broaden the scope to not just academia, but to any career, I think for the most part, when you graduate from university, you'll be coming into entry level type jobs. And you might think, oh, wow, this is kind of, you know, it sucks, you know, low pay and, and long hours. But if you shine and you really impress the higher ups, you'll move up the chain fairly quickly, or at least if there's no openings, they'll consider you when there are openings. Because it's, it's, it is not always what you know, but who you know. And that's part of the networking. And if you, um, if you really shine above all the other coworkers that you have, and you, uh, you, know, you put in the extra effort to just do an exceptional job, and you actually are, you're happy with what you do, I think it goes back to uh, what we were talking about before, find the things that you you really enjoy doing and, and, and get jobs and, 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 and follow your career paths in terms of what you like to do, um, you'll move up the career scale and you'll find the jobs. And you won't have to, like, there's a lot of doom and gloom because the economy, is, it's, it's crappy. Well, it's probably going to be crappy for a long time because um, uh, we're, in, we're in a very transitional change with the economy, right? Mm -hmm. We're going from, like, an American-based economy to the Asian uh, currencies becoming more and more powerful. And so, uh, the, the, the way that currency is affecting the way uh, uh, the economies of, of the world interrelate, it's going to make it very hard for us in North America for quite a while. Um, but I think 
that doesn't mean you'll never have a job. It doesn't mean you won't have a job in what you want to do or what you care about. I think it's just a matter of finding what your, your niche is and becoming very highly specialized and creative and following your, your heart to get to that niche and to get to all those different career paths that you'll enjoy and, and probably look on back on your retirement years and uh, think, wow, I had quite the life. Right, because if you do just one thing, you know, you might you might look back and go, wow, I, I spent all my life in that one career. But if you have different careers and you, you you're you're hopeful about your prospects and you try different things, I think uh, mm -hmm. I think you'll you'll look back in your retirement years and you'll be very happy with what you uh, you accomplished. Thank you. I think one of the things me. that um, has been reinforced in my mind from this just witnessing this panel and hearing all of your advice and your stories and so forth is that there isn't one career for mm -mm. each of us. There, there might be multiple careers, there might be parallel careers, there might be, um, and what you're interested in, Jordan, you said it earlier, and what you're interested in when you're 20 something, maybe something, may not be what you're interested in when you're 30 something mm -hmm. or 40 something or so on, right? And so um, the importance earlier on with some of our panelists talked about being open um, to different opportunities, being open to all of the, the things that interest you and intrigue you and um, stimulate you and, and possibly looking at those uh, those areas as ways to find a, uh, find employment or um, make uh, like make a meaningful livelihood. Um, but also to, um, and, and uh, some of our panelists also talked about the importance of um, being positive in your thinking and, and uh, engage, engaging people in, in um, meaningful conversations. And so all of those skills that you gained as a result of your studies um, can be applied to your job search and, and can be applied moving forward in your career development. So hopefully that um, um, you walked away with some of that as well. Um, and hopefully um, some of the stories that have been shared ha have inspired you somewhat. Um, I would like to, um, so this it concludes our formal Q&A session. Um, I would like to encourage you to come to the Career Center. There's, you're not alone. Um, so what I'm hearing from the room is that you know there's some, some, so, some anxiety around what's next, um, around um, okay, so where do I go from here? Um, and that's 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 all fine and it's natural and we're here to support you. Um, so whether you are sort of asking the question about what can I do with my degree. Um, or maybe you have an idea of what you want to do. Maybe you, you, you've decided, I want to go to law school. Um, so whatever it is that you're, wherever you are in terms of your career journey, um, the Career Center is here to help and provide support. So you're not alone, okay? Yeah, I have um, one thing. Yes, Ken. Uh, are we done? Almost, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have something that you can do with your degree. Uh, I suggest that you spend a really pleasant day at the annual conference of the Ontario Philosophy Teachers Association. It's Friday, May the 4th. Uh, our website is ontariophilosophy, all one word, dot ca. Uh, we have a plenary session and uh, a frontline speaker. Uh, we have sessions throughout the day. It's at University of Toronto Schools, UTS, at Spadina and Bloor. And uh, great pubs, great food, just within walking distance. Well, that's important. Uh, just within walking distance. So Friday, May 4, and please check ontariophilosophy.ca because we post the session leaders and the plenary speakers as we arrange for them. That might be Thank another you. opportunity to talk to more people and, and build new Network, relationships. Network, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you.